Hey everyone, welcome to episode one of the Math Lab, where your questions meet answers. That's not a good tagline, is it? Thank you so much to everyone who submitted questions for this week's Math Lab. There were some amazing questions coming in and it was such a shame that I could only pick three for this week. But we've got three fantastic questions for you today, so let's dive straight in. Okay, question one comes from Sebastian, who asks, can you explain the probability three doors pick one prize isn't there, but isn't 50-50 for the two remaining? Okie dokie. So what Sebastian is talking about is the Monty Hall paradox. Now this comes from a game show called Let's Make a Deal, where the host Monty had three doors. Behind one of the doors was a car, and behind the other two doors were goats. Now Monty assumed that the contestant would want to win the car, and he asked them to pick a door. When they picked their door, he would then open one of the other doors to reveal a goat. Now, once the goat had been revealed, Monty then gave the contestant the chance to stick with their original door or switch to the other door. The question is, are you more likely to win the car if you stick or if you switch? Now, if you think that there's a 50-50 chance and it doesn't really matter what you do, that would be wrong. You are actually twice as likely to win the car if you switch. Now, this isn't particularly intuitive, and if you still think there's a 50-50 chance, you are not on your own. When Marilyn Voss Savant, the woman who has the highest IQ listed in the Guinness World Records, answered this question in her column, Ask Marilyn, and she told readers that you were twice as likely to win if you switch, she got thousands of letters from people writing in to tell her she was wrong, in that, a thousand of them had PhDs and there were also notable mathematicians who wrote in to tell her she was wrong. So if you still think it's 50-50, you're in good company, but that would be wrong. Let's have a look at why. So my motto is, if in doubt, draw it out. Let's have a look at the possible scenarios. So we're going to assume that we pick door one. Now, listed below are the possible options. So there could either be a car behind door one and goats behind the others, the car could be behind do door two, or it could be behind door three. So these are the possible options. Now, in scenario one, Monty is going to open one of the other doors. Let's just say he opens door three in this case to reveal this goat here, okay? This is the option where if we switch, we lose. So I'll put an L there, because we have actually stumbled upon the door with the car behind it. So option one, if we switch, we lose. In option two, there's a goat behind our door. Monty is again going to open door three because he's going to reveal a goat. In this scenario, if we switch, we win because the car is behind door two. Now, option three, there's a goat behind our door again. This time, Monty is going to open door number two to reveal a goat. Once again, if we switch, we win. So now you can see that you are twice as likely to win if you switch doors. There is only one scenario out of the three that you win by sticking to your door. Now, if you still don't believe me, then think about this scenario. Suppose you pick your door, and now Monty, instead of opening another door, says to you, you can either switch and have both other doors, or you can stick to your original door. What would you do now? Because if you think about it, it's exactly the same. Him showing you the goat and offering you to switch to bo both doors is the same scenario. You would know that you'd have a one in three chance of picking the car the first time round, but there was a two in three chance that you didn't. And if you're going to get both of those doors, sure, you're going to win a goat as well, but you're going to get the car. If that still doesn't make sense, think about the scenario where there are a hundred doors. So now suppose that you pick your door, you've got a one in hundred chance of being correct. Now suppose that Monty opens 98 doors to show you goats. Now are you going to stick or are you going to switch? You're going to switch. There is far more chance that you were wrong with your first guess than that you picked the door first time round. So next time if you find yourself in a game show with a situation like this, always switch. You're not guaranteed to win the car but you are twice as likely. Okay, our second question comes from S.D. Bredemeyer, who says, my son is struggling with equivalent fractions. Help, third grade. I'm here to help. Right, let's have a look. Okay, the best way of thinking about equivalent fractions are different names for things that are the same. A bit like 
soccer and football. But the things we're talking about are fractions. So let's take a look. Always good with fractions to think of pizza or cake. So we've got two pizzas here. In the pizza on the left, it's cut into two slices and we've got one of those slices shaded. In the pizza on the right, it's cut into eight slices and we've got four of those slices shaded. There is no difference in the amount of pizza here. One out of two is exactly the same as four out of eight. The only difference is the size of the slices. And that's exactly how equivalent fractions work. They're gonna be fractions that might look different, the numbers will be different, but the amount represented is exactly the same. Now, we don't have to start with a half, we could start with any fraction. So in this example, this pizza on the left has been cut into thirds, into three slices. So here's one of those slices, that would be one over three one third. But in this one over here, the pizza has been cut into six slices. Shading the exact same amount of pizza is going to be two slices out of six. One third is equal to two six. Those fractions are equivalent. They represent exactly the same amount of pizza. Now, how do we find equivalent fractions? Well, one way we can do it is, let's start with a half again is we can multiply the numerator and the denominator, that's the top number and the bottom number, by the same number. So pick any number you want. Let's say we multiply them both by five. So we multiply the top by five and the bottom by five. One times five is five, two times five is 10. We found a, a fraction that's equivalent to a half. It would represent exactly the same amount of pizza, but with different sli size slices. Slice slice sizes with different slice sizes. Okay, let's try another one. Suppose we start with three quarters. Let's multiply by, pick a number, Jack. 12. 12, okay, three times 12. Get your 12 times tables out, everyone. Three times 12 is 36. Four times 12 is 48. These two fractions, three quarters and 36 48ths are equivalent. They represent the same amount of our thing, just different slice sizes. Now, we don't only have to multiply, we could also divide. This is a process known as simplifying. The only problem with dividing is we can't always divide because we want to make sure that our numbers remain as whole numbers. So let's have a look at this one, 50 over 100. I could divide the top and bottom by 50. I would be able to, because these are both multiples of 50, I would keep my numbers whole. 50 divided by 50 is one, 100 divided by 50 is two. I've made an equivalent fraction. 50 over 100 is equivalent to a half. They represent the same value, but they've got slightly different numbers. Now, just a quick look at why this works. So let's go back to our half again and we're gonna multiply top and bottom by three. Now, if I wrote that slightly differently, like this, one over two times three over three. Now, if you're familiar with multiplying fractions, you'll know that you just multiply the tops and you multiply the bottoms. So I'm doing exactly the same thing here. I'm multiplying the top and the bottom by three. One times three is three, two times three is six. I've made an equivalent fraction, but let's just have a look at this fraction here, three over three. Three over three is exactly the same as one, right? Because it's three divided by three. So what I'm actually doing when I'm making an equivalent fraction is I'm just multiplying by one. And multiplying by one doesn't do anything. It doesn't change the number. But what happens here, because of a quirk of fractions, because they're made up of a numerator and a denominator, I can multiply by fractions that equal one and I can change the numbers. So that's why we're able to multiply. As long as we multiply the top and the bottom by the same number, we're technically multiplying by one. We're not actually changing the value of the fraction, but we're changing the numbers in the fraction and we have an equivalent fraction. Okay, so I hope that helps you to understand equivalent fractions a little bit better. Uh, for a deeper dive into fractions, I really recommend our Complete Guide to Fractions ebook. We cover the full topic of fractions, including equivalent ones. And this doesn't just tell you what to do, it explains why you do it. So that leads to a deeper understanding and there's loads of practice questions too. So check that out for a deep dive into fractions. Okay, question three comes from Mrs. Cohen's year five maths group. Hi everyone, they've sent me a bunch of incredible letters. They've got drawings on them, they've colored them in, 
tip if you want to get your question answered on the math lab make me some drawings i particularly like this one from benji who's written p.s ignore my decorations i'm not good at drawing there's some fantastic drawings on here and one of them is a star and benji's written star or something else and then there's another one that's called a bumpy line benji i think you're brilliant at drawing and even more i think if you keep putting your drawings together with your personality people are going to absolutely want to read your comic books so keep them coming the main question that these guys asked was how did you get so confident at maths so i thought that would be a good one to answer today Okay, so I think the main thing that knocks our confidence when we're learning is making mistakes. As soon as we make a mistake, we think, oh no, I'm not very good at this, I should just give up. But the fact is that mistakes are a really important part of learning. We try something, we may or may not get it right, we have a look at what went wrong, and then we try again and we get a bit closer to the answer. And something about confidence is that it's not usually based on our actual abilities, but our belief in our abilities. And you'll see this whenever you see someone trying to parallel park in a space that's clearly too small for their car. It's that belief that they can do it that gives them the confidence to try. So even if you're struggling with maths, even if you're making mistakes, know that you can still be confident to give it a go. Now, I'm not suggesting that you just write down two plus two equals five with all the confidence in the world and off you go. But what I'm saying is have the confidence to give two plus two a go. It's a choice. Feel confident in your abilities to give it a go. And if you do come up with five, if you do get it wrong, don't be deterred. Have a look at why you got it wrong, adapt and try again. Think about your heroes, but think about them before they became the person that you look up to. They didn't always have the abilities that you admire in them today. Messi and Ronaldo, there was a point where they couldn't even walk, let alone kick a ball. The thing was, they weren't signed to PSG at the time, so you didn't get to see it. Lang Lang didn't know his middle C from the North Sea, but he wasn't playing at concerts at that point, so you didn't get to see it. Beyonce couldn't even talk. But we don't see those parts. We only see what happens after years, decades of hard work. And it's important not to forget that. Now, I'm not saying that talent doesn't play a part. It does, but it doesn't play anywhere near as big a part as we'd like to think. Hard work is everything. So firstly, have the confidence, believe that you can do something because you can. Understand that you will make mistakes, you will get things wrong. It's all a part of the learning process. When we believe believe that we can do something, we are actually far more likely to improve at that thing. There's actual research that shows that. It's called growth mindset. It's the idea that we understand that our abilities aren't fixed where they are. They can be changed. We can learn, we can grow, we can understand new things. Simply believing that, having the confidence to know that we can, is going to help us improve. And as we improve, our confidence increases. So in other words, if you want to have more confidence in maths, fake it till you make it. Okay, thanks so much for joining us for our first episode of the Math Lab. We really hope you enjoyed it. Let us know. You can vote to see more of these episodes by hitting the like button, leave us a comment, and also give us your submissions for next week's Math Lab. Drop your questions either in the comments, send them in a DM, however you want to send them, and we'll pick another few questions for next week where we'll hopefully have come up with a slightly better tagline. Have a great week. See you next time. <laughs> <laughs>